Uh, last time, the format was basically a lot of question and answers about your priority needs. Uh, today, we're going to go be a bit more structured, um, go th from beginning to end uh, through a number of the training slides. I won't go through all of them in detail. There is not time for that. This is designed as a one-day training or as a two-day training. Um, but, you know, I will start from the beginning using some of these slides. I will now go through overview. I don't think I will do Hunet's installation. Uh, I think you've already done installation. You don't need me to teach you how to install software. Um, there are people there who can help you install software if there are any problems. If there are questions on installation, let me know. But I plan on doing Hunet 1 overview, followed by Hunet 3 laboratory configuration. I will also try to go a bit more slowly, but please let me know if you have trouble understanding. I'm going to Hunet 1 overview. You don't need to do anything on your side for this presentation, this, this, this first presentation. Simply just watch and listen. So Hunet is surveillance of antimicrobial resistance, but not only antimicrobial resistance. It is surveillance of routine, usually microbiology data, to study evolving microbial populations, including antibiotic resistance. So if there's an outbreak, it doesn't matter if it's sensitive or resistant, you still want to know. So Hunet is a software for managing microbiology data, especially most commonly routine data. So I work with Dr. Thomas O'Brien, uh, who started this work. <laughs> if I go back, he started his work really around 1964, 1962. He trained with Kirby and Bauer. So he's been working this for a very long time. Uh, and he had a vision. When he was head of the microbiology laboratory, he saw that the results of the microbiology laboratory were valuable for patient care, of course. That's why we do the tests. But in addition, the microbiology laboratory provides valuable data for epidemiology and quality and knowing about new threats in a way different from chemistry and blood bank hematology. In those labs, the focus is on the patient. In microbiology, there are two areas of focus. There's the patient that must be treated, but there are also the bacteria and viruses and parasites. So he had a vision that routine clinical microbiology laboratories generate routine data every day that could and should be utilized to provide a detailed view of evolving microbial populations in real time, in addition to patient care support. However, the data from routine laboratories remains largely untapped and underutilized. So his idea was that the use of a common software supports local, national, regional, and global collaborations to support a number of objectives. The recognition, tracking, and containment of emerging threats, both resistant and non-resistant. Cost-effective care and treatment guidelines. Public health policy, interventions, advocacy, research. And very importantly, in our early discussions, is to improve laboratory capacity. In the first one or two years of most surveillance initiatives, the most interesting findings, the most unusual findings are often not true. They are often due to errors in laboratory testing and results or simple biases. If you only collect samples from intensive care unit patients, you will end up with very good data for intensive care unit patients, but those data are not generalizable to the community. So when we get later to data analysis, I will always start with a review of the data from a quality control perspective, followed by an epidemiological and microbiological perspective. We developed HUNET with two objectives in mind. First of all, to improve the use of local data for local purposes. And secondly, to promote national and international collaborations. The most important use there are the local uses. Why are the local uses so important? Well, we need local per, we need the local data for local outbreak detection, local antibiotic use policy, improving the local data capacity. 
It is at the local level that the patient sees a physician. The physician works with the laboratory to make a decision about an antibiotic for the patient to receive. So in terms of the control of resistance, we really need to think about that level of the patient and the physician and the local pharmacy and the laboratory. That is one reason why the local is so important. The other reason that local is so important is for sustainability. If the reason, if the reason all of you are doing HUNET and data entry and data management is because WHO asked you to do it or IDDS or EPHI, it's not going to survive in the long term. For this to survive in the long term, there needs to be a value to the data entry people. You know, if we do, if they, if it's a short term, they will do it often because people ask them. But for this to survive for two years, five years, ten years, there must be some value to the people who are doing all of the data entry. So that's why we feel local is so important. Of course, at the national level, in, international, there are additional benefits: benchmarking, mentoring, looking for national pictures of resistance, national pictures of outbreaks, and antibiotic policy. Um, internationally. WHO uses these data for a number of objectives, one of which is gap identification. Which countries have data, which countries don't have data? Which countries have good quality data? Which countries have obvious mistakes? Um, this is, a, I need to update this, but we have the WHONET homepage. The software is free. So go to the webpage and you can download the software, the tutorials, and some other information. Uh, this slide we also need to update. This is an older picture of HUNET registrations and use from around the world. You see a lot of HUNET use in Latin America because I started 30 years ago. A lot in Europe 30 years ago, East Asia 30 years ago. Other countries started 20 years ago, like the EARSnet project for remaining European countries. CSER for Central Asia, Eastern Europe started about eight years ago. Um, and now because of the Fleming Fund and because of GLASS and because of the initiatives of ministries of health and the WHO World Health Assembly resolutions, we see more and more use now in Africa, South Asia, which is relatively new for some of the countries. We will talk about two softwares, the WHONET software and the Backlink software. WHONET is for data entry, data analysis, and data sharing. That's the more important software. That's the reason we are doing all of this is so that people can benefit from HUNET. We now have about 28 languages. Uh, the desktop version has been available for 30 years. The web version, unfortunately, has been on the back burner because I only have one programmer and we, you know, we don't have time to do everything we would like. We had a very significant advance last week where we completed the final, final, final retirement of some of our old technologies. So I am very pleased to say that in the months that come, you will start to see much more quickly new features, new possibilities. We will not start with the web. We will start with standard reports, more outbreak things and other features along those lines. But after we do some of those low hanging fruit, high priority needs, then we will finally get back to the web version. Backlink is useful if a laboratory already has a computer system. Throughout the high, medium, and low resource world, a large number of facilities have a system, an IT system for lab microbiology laboratory data. Sometimes those systems are very expensive, very complete. Uh, the commercial systems such as Cerner and Meditech and SunQuest, you have mid-range systems um, which focus more on final results and then you have the low end systems like Excel. People just put the data into Excel or Access. Many people also have data in a machine like a Vitec or a Microscan or a Phoenix. The purpose of Backlink is to avoid double data entry. If the data have already been entered into your computer system, we would like to use Backlink to transfer the data into HUNET in a semi-automatic manner so you can drive all of the benefit from your data, but without the need to manually re-enter the data. You can do that once a year, once a month, month once a week. In my own hospital, we do this automatic daily. We download the data at 1 o'clock in the morning. At 1.15, Backlink automatically runs without us being there. One thirty, HUNET runs a series of analyses. So in the morning, nobody looks at HUNET. 
at 1.30, at, at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, our infection control staff and our laboratory staff look at the output. They look at the Excel files or the access files. So all of HUNET and Backlink can be automated. When you install HUNET, Backlink installs at the same time. So you do not have to install them separately. The two softwares are distributed together. So we will look at the three HUNET modules. The most interesting module is the last one, data analysis. That's the reason we are doing this. You can look at interactive analysis or standard reports. Um, so we really want to focus a lot in our training on data analysis. However, before doing data analysis, you must do data entry manually or using backlink. You can also use HUNET to do clinical reports. That's the boring part of HUNET data entry. But before doing data entry, you have to prepare HUNET and that's laboratory configuration. And that's where we will begin our training. What do you do in laboratory configuration? You basically tell HUNET who you are, what antibodies you have, your locations. It's basically configuring the data entry screen. So we will do configuration, followed by data entry, followed by data analysis. And at some point, we will also discuss backlink on how to get the data transferred into HUNET. I will show you screens from all of the softwares to just to give you a little orientation. So here in laboratory configuration, we start, oops, uh, oh, I thought there were, uh, I thought there were red lines, red circles, an animated version, but this is not, this, this software, this slides I'm showing you are not animated. So at the top of the screen, you choose your country. We have a special country for demonstration purposes called WHO. You put your laboratory name, your laboratory code. Uh, this has always been a three letter code, but next week we are changing it to a six letter code so that you can make the code longer if you would like. You can say that if your hospital is predominantly human data, you choose human. But if you work in a public health laboratory, a food laboratory, an animal laboratory, you might want to choose the second option for human animal food environment. HUNET for human animal food environment is almost identical to just for human only. It just gives you additional features. What kind of animal, um, uh, what kind of food? Uh, so I will show both, but there are very tiny differences between the two. So that you answer those questions at the top. Then you have four boxes, four buttons at the bottom of the screen, four command buttons. Uh, the first one is usually required. What antibiotics do you test? Do you do CLSI? Do you do UCAST? Do you do diffusion? Do you do CL um, uh, MIC? Do you do E-test? Do you do a combination? Most labs do a combination. They should do some disks, some E-test, for example. You can also tell HUNET your panels. Panels, what do I mean by that? Panels is to make the life of the data entry person easier. If I'm entering a gram-negative organism, I want to see my gram-negative antibiotics. If I'm entering an enterococcus, I want to see my enterococcus antibiotics. So this feature for antibiotics allows you to define the complete list of all of the antibiotics that you test, and then you can customize it by telling HUNET which antibiotics go with which organism grouping. That is called panels. Then we can enter the locations. What does location mean? Well, it means what you want it to mean. If you work in a hospital, the location typically means the name of the ward or the name of the clinic, diabetes clinic, ICU, uh, medicine male, medicine female. So for a hospital location, typically is the name of the hospital ward or the name of the hospital clinic. On the other hand, if you work in a national center like EPHI, the location might be the name of the hospital or the name of the town, the name of the district, uh, the name of the region. Um, or if you work in an animal laboratory, the, labor the location might be the name of the farm, the name of the market, the name of the veterinary clinic, the name of the slaughterhouse. Or if you work with food, the name, the, the location might be the name of the restaurant, the name of the market. So the word location is a very general word. You define location in the way that is most interesting for you. If you work in a hospital, you usually want to know the location where the sample was collected inside the hospital. But at the national level, sometimes you just want to know the name of the hospital or the name of the region or the name of the city. Finally, there are data, well, then there are data fields. 
Uh, HUNET, when you start HUNET with new laboratory, HUNET gives you a predefined set of commonly requested data fields, patient number, patient name, gender, date of birth, location, location type, like inpatient, outpatient, simplified, specimen date, specimen number, organism, beta-lactamase, the antibiotic results we discussed, comment. These are the normal HUNET data field questions. A data field is simply a question that you will see when you get to data entry. HUNET allow, and most hospitals are happy with that list, and they don't change the list. But there are good reasons to change the list. Some people want to add more information. What was the diagnosis? What was the name of the doctor? What was the gram stain? So HUNET gives you a standard list, but using this feature in front of you called data fields, you can add more questions that might be valuable for your hospital or for your country. You can also remove questions that are not needed. For example, if you're working in an animal laboratory, you do not need the animal's first and last name. If you're working in a food laboratory, I don't, know, I don't want to know the age of my food or the gender of my food. So if there are questions you want to add, you can add them. If there are questions that are not relevant, you can remove them. So for data fields, you can just customize it to match what you want to see in the data entry form. Finally, on the screen, you see the alerts. Uh, it's a very valuable feature, but most people don't change it. If you want to change it, you can. But in alerts, we give you about 190 predefined rules. There are high priority alerts, medium priority alerts, and low priority alerts. Examples of high priority alerts, we have Neisseria gonorrhea is important, Vibrio cholera is important, Salmonella typhi is important, those are important species, or CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, yes. CRE are important, VRSA, vancomycin resistant staph aureus, are important. So these are high priority important species, important resistance. Then you have medium priority, MRSA, uh, VRE, ESBL, they are important, they are also relatively common. And then you have low priority alerts. Low priority alerts are primarily quality control. For example, Klebsiella pneumonia, sensitive to ampicillin, it's possible, but it is rare. Most Klebsiella pneumonia, 95, 98, 99% of Klebsiella pneumonia are ampicillin resistant. If you do find a laboratory result, Klebsiella pneumonia, ampicillin sensitive, it might be true, but it also might be a mistake. It might be a mistake in data entry. It might be a mistake in the antibiotic result. It might be a mistake in the organism. Maybe it is ampicillin sensitive, but maybe it is an E. coli and not a Klebsiella. So these low priority quality control alerts can help the laboratory to find problems and address them and investigate them quickly. Just because you're going to pause for a question, please. When after this slide, can we pause for a question? Of course. Thank you for thank you for reminding me of that. So HUNET gives you about 190 alerts, and most people are happy with those alerts. But you can add more alerts, or you can delete alerts that are not useful for you. And then you click on save, and that is your configuration. You have saved your antibiotics, your locations, your data fields, and then you are ready for data entry. And then after that, you will be ready for data analysis. If you want to make any changes, simple. You just click on Modify Laboratory, you come back to the screen, and you make the needed modifications. So I will stop there. And what are, are there any questions? Zil Alam, do you want to ask a question in chat? I, I think you're on mute, Zalem. There's a question in the chat box. Uh, suppose we have data from sites having their own configuration. Does HUNET allow us to assign a new lab code when we are interested in merging them? There, yeah, so typically in a country, every lab has their own configuration, their own antibiotics, their own locations. So HUNET at the national level has no trouble with that. Um, so for the things that you care about, like inpatient versus outpatient, um, a minimum core set of antibiotics, you would like to introduce some degree of standardization. 
So in answer to your question, it is not a problem that everybody does something different. But for the things, the minimal things that are most important where you want standardization, I would like to recommend standardization. This can be standardization in data entry or standardization in laboratory testing. Um, for example, the names of the medical wards like Medicine Male, Medicine Female, Fifth Floor or Fifth Floor North, those, the labs should do exactly what they want to make it most customized and useful for them. On the other hand, at the national level, there's certain things we would like them to try to standardize. You know, they're also just testing issues. If maybe nine of the laboratories test Imipenem and one of the laboratories test Maripenem, at the national level, it would just be easier if everybody tested Imipenem. So in a later session, I will show you about national data merging, national data management, national feedback, uh, and then facility specific feedback. So yes, it is not a problem if everybody does something different. Hunet has no trouble manage, m m bringing them all together. On the other hand, for the things that you do care about, those things I would like to try to introduce standardization. So when people send me things, sometimes I say, that's perfectly fine. I don't need it at the national level. Continue to do what you're doing. In other cases, I say, can you please change this? Um, um, OK, great. Uh, as an example, uh, WHONET is a field for the, med the patient medical record number. Somebody removed that, and they replaced it with something called national ID, which is what they were using in their country. The problem is some of the labs had the patient number in this column, but this lab had the national medical record number, the, mass the national, patient the national uh, citizen registration number in this column. Because they were in different columns, it was inconvenient. So mostly if they do something different, I'm okay with that. But sometimes I do want to standardize it if it is something I plan to analyze. Other questions? Yes, John, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, this is Gabriel. Good morning and good afternoon for all of you. I'm glad that you can make it, thank you. <laughs> so my first question is, is the new version of phone eight uh, can we access data from sites and also can you communicate with sites uh, online? Is that possible? Okay, um, I'll answer that in two parts. The, mm -hmm. the version of Hunet that we use and distribute and support is the desktop application. The software is not online. So you can share data online by email or secure file transfer. Uh, in Vietnam, they have made a nice web portal where they can upload the data. They did not use Hunet for that. Um, but so they do collect the data through the web using a solution that they developed nationally. So Hunet is a desktop application. If people have data from Hunet, the new Hunet 2020, Hunet 5.6, Hunet 2, every version of Hunet is still compatible. So if you have any HUNET data from 1989, HUNET can still read it. So even if you have different versions of HUNET, don't worry, the current HUNET can still read them. So don't worry about the version of HUNET, we can still share the data. But it is a desktop application. It is sitting on your hard drive or on one of your server drives. We will be oh, making oh. a web version mm -hmm. so that you can do data entry online and data analysis online. We have a reasonable demonstration version, but it is only as a demonstration. It is not ready for use. Um, I want to mention the example in Vietnam. They have some very good IT people there. I've been working them for many years. So they use Hunet for a number of things, but they have also made additional utilities. And one of them is a web portal. And in fact, Mikel was very involved in this. They have a web portal for uploading Hunet data into their national DHIS2 platform. So there's a mm. web portal for where a laboratory uploads the data automatically into the national database. They have the ability to analyze the data on the web platform. Their analyses are not as complete or as rich as the WHONET analyses. So they can still use WHONET for doing outbreak detection and other things, but they can also use DHIS2 for a number of things. So this is an example where there is not a web version of Hunet, but they have made a portal for using Hunet data on the web. 
I also had a conversation in a training over the last few weeks with Sri Lanka. And that's been very interesting for me because like many of you, he knows who net use for facilities very well. For He goes to hospitals, he trains them in HUNET, he teaches them HUNET. So he does that very well. He knows individual laboratory use of HUNET well, but there's a lot he did not know at the national level. He did not know how to merge the data from the different hospitals. And so part of this training was very useful for him because I usually do not give training courses to national data managers. National data managers is usually more one-on-one, -on -one, question answer but when i go to the country we give a formal training course to a lot of people and often there's not enough time for the national data manager so similarly in ethiopia based on your questions you know many of you do know hunad very well for individual laboratory use but i hope as part of this training we can also give you some tips and shortcuts and value for in addition working with network data at the national level Okay. okay there are two countries argentina and the philippines where we have a project where we are also using uh softwares called um uh, win scp and filezilla to do automatic secure file transfer protocol that is abbreviated sftp so ftp is file transfer protocol sftp is the same thing but it's secure mm -hmm. this is one of many technologies to automatically send data in a secure manner. So in fact, they, at the national level, every day, they do have the HUNET data files. They did not use HUNET to do that. They used normal Windows utilities. At the local level, the people manually enter data into HUNET, and automatically, every day, they use one of these softwares I mentioned to send the data to the national level. So this is an example of an online automated daily up-to-date system that uses normal Windows softwares, but it does not use HUNET. In the future, we will offer an option within HUNET, but you can already do it now. You, don't, you do not need HUNET to send files securely in an automated way. This could also be a value to Vietnam. You know, right now, they were interested in that. Right now, they have a monthly manual data upload, but that manual data upload could be replaced by automated daily with a secure email, a secure file transfer, um, so there's a lot that could be done for sharing data in a secure manner that do not rely on HUNET. In the future, I want to put some of those into HUNET, but you do not need to wait for us. You can already use many Windows softwares for doing this. So what do you advise to, for us to use uh, uh, any kind of software that can uh, secure our data? Because currently, uh, data is coming through email, which is not really uh, uh, secure. That's a very important question. I would say in the majority of countries, unfortunately, the most common way to share HUNET data is just by sending a normal email once a month. Two problems with that, it's not automated, so somebody has to manually send the email. At the other end, somebody has to manually open the email and save the attachment. The other issue, it's not secure. So, um, uh, so there are, so we, we, but now countries, are starting to move in a better direction where they're starting to require patient protections. Uh, in the United States, this, we, this has always been true. We have a law called HIPAA, so you cannot send an email. You have to do it in a proper way. Um, you cannot send a normal email. So how can we send the data? You can send the data using a secure email, or you can send the data with a normal email, but with a password protected secure attachment. So they could send you a normal email, but they could actually put a password onto the attachment. So that's a secure email, a normal email with secure attachment, but those are both email approaches, for example, once a month. The other, pro or there's the web portal, that's what Vietnam does. Someone goes to a website and they upload the HUNET files. So these are three ways that you could have a secure transfer once a month. What I described for Argentina and Philippines is they use these softwares called FileZilla or uh, Qt FTP or WinSCP. The name of these softwares, they are secure file transfer protocol softwares. So there are many options for you. And one advantage of these is that they can be scheduled. You can do this automatic every day at one o'clock in the morning. 
So yes, I do agree. Let's try to come up with an appropriate secure solution for you. Uh, so should we do the secure email approach, the web portal approach, or should we do the secure FTP approach? Uh, the answer to that really depends on how often you want the data. If you plan to analyze the data monthly, they could just email you the data monthly. And that's a good way to start. There's so much going on. There's so many things that we would like to do. So just if you collect the data monthly in a secure way, this would be a big improvement on what you are currently doing. You will still get the data monthly, but it will be in a secure way. On the other hand, if you do want automatic daily analysis, automatic daily feedback, automatic investigation of local or national outbreaks, then one of these SFTP solutions would be appropriate for us to discuss. Okay, thank you. Maybe can you send me all these, you know, the type of source tape so that we can use because currently we are looking, uh, you know, to solve this problem. We collect data every month, but it is through email. So I'm not comfortable with that because it's not uh, secure. Sometimes they send it in their personal email, uh, even though we gave them uh, uh, a different email. So just summarize this, I mean, send us uh, the type of software that different countries use so that we can go for that. Thank you for that explanation. We have sure. to solve it immediately. Yeah. Yes. And, and, I, send me. yeah. Yes. and, and I just request that somebody sends me a specific email to request that. My life is controlled by my inbox. I turn on my inbox and I yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I will. I will send you a separate email for that. Perfectly. Thank you. Um, and okay. the other question is, I have also another question. We have also a plan to capture both human and animal data in one location as a pilot. So yes. can you tell us how we can configure UNET to capture both the data? Yes, definitely. Uh, so right now we are discussing the UNET overview at the high level with this first slide set. After that, I will continue with a live demonstration of net laboratory configuration so i will answer that question during the demonstration of laboratory configuration and also during data entry okay thank you i already mentioned on the screen because i don't know when you join the call you see those two options there at the top human versus human animal food that is the first step if you want human animal and food you choose the second option um, if you're a hospital laboratory that does 99 percent 99% human and a little bit of food, a little bit of animal, I would still just use human. Uh, but if you do a lot of animal, a lot of food, then I suggest the second option. So this is laboratory configuration. It's basically preparing the data entry screen so that you can later do data entry and data analysis. Moving on, uh, to click here, great. Data entry. First of all, at the top, the first question is this human or animal or food? So to change, all you do is change from human to animal to food. Uh, HUNET also has environmental and feed, but those are not developed. So the three working priorities are human, animal, food. And very simple, if you change from human to animal, some of the questions you see here will disappear. We do not need to know the animal's first and last name. We do, do, we, we do not plan on throwing the animal a birthday party, so we don't need the animal's date of birth. Similarly, if you change the question to food, the questions again will change. So that's really the only difference. You change the origin from human to animal to food, and then it will change the questions on the screen. The location questions will stay the same, the specimen locations, the microbiology results, but the quote unquote patient origin questions will depend. Okay, um, great. So the data entry screen, you choose human animal food. If you choose human, it will ask you the number, first name, last name, sex, date of birth, age, age category is basically adult or pediatric. If you have it, the date of admission is very useful. I do recommend it, uh, but it's often not realistic. It depends on if the laboratory has it. Many laboratories say we don't have it, but we can ask for it You know, next year. So they have a data entry form. Sometimes the date of admission is on the data entry form, but nobody fills it in. Or sometimes it is not on the data entry form and they can add it. So maybe this year you don't have date of admission, but something often, it's something that could be added in the future. We like date of admission because it helps us to separate inpatient infections from outpatient infections. 
if you have somebody who becomes very sick on Monday and goes to the ICU on Monday and has an E. coli in the ICU on Monday, that's still a community infection. They were hospitalized because of their infection. So if a patient has an infection, a sample, an E. coli on hospital day one, on hospital day two, most of those will be community infections. If somebody has an E. coli or a Staph aureus on hospital three, four, and five, it's more probable that it is going to be a hospital infection. There's not a perfect definition, but it's a simple definition. If it's hospital day one or hospital day two, we're going to call it a community infection. If it is hospital three, four, and five, we're going to call it a hospital infection. That's a nice simple rule. It is not a perfect rule, but a perfect rule you need the patient's medical chart, you need somebody to read every, and you cannot do that. So date of admission is helpful to just helping you to, on average, separate the inpatient infections from the outpatient infections. As I said, it's not realistic for many places in the short term, but hopefully in the long term, people can consider it. Next, you have the location information that could be the ward or the clinic or the farm or the restaurant or the, the veterinary clinic. Um, so location is simply what you want it to mean. Uh, department would be like medicine and surgery. That's not really relevant for uh, animals or food, but location type is inpatient, outpatient, farm, restaurant. Again, location is very specific. You, the laboratory puts exactly what they want. Laboratory type, we try to introduce some standards just so at the national level, you can have some degree of separation of inpatients and outpatients in a reliable, consistent way. Next specimen number, specimen date, specimen type. Reason most people leave that empty. In a hospital laboratory, 99% of the work is diagnostic. You are taking care of sick people. You might also be doing some research samples or some screening samples. So a lot of people just leave reason empty, but if you want, you can enter that as well. Finally, the, micro the microbiology results, organism, serotype, beta lactamase, these are all optional. You can add more questions if you want, like gram stain, or you can remove questions. Like if you're working with salmonella, you don't need the beta lactate. You don't, if you're a food laboratory with salmonella, beta lactamase is not a relevant test. ESBL is, but not the normal beta lactamase. At the bottom, we see our antibiotics, DISC, MICE test. This is the full list. This is all of the antibiotics. But if I put in E. coli, most of these antibiotics will disappear because HUNET will only show me the gram-negative antibiotics. I referred to that earlier as the panels. So if I choose a Staph aureus, that list will become focused on Staph aureus, on Staphylococci. If I put Neisseria gonorrhea, it will show me the Neisseria gonorrhea. So that's what I talked about, the full antibiotic list, which is what you see here, as well as the, the panel list. And the panel depends on the organism. After you enter these questions at the top right of the screen, you see it says save isolate, so you click on save isolate. When it will ask you, do you want to save the isolate and start a new isolate? Or do you want to save the isolate and continue with the same specimen? You know, for example, you, have, you do have a, a blood culture with an E. coli, but it also has a Staph aureus. So in that case, I don't want to retype the name and the date of birth and the specimen number, the specimen date. It's the same sample. So if I say, yes, I want to continue with the same sample, you only need to put in the microbiology results. At the top of the screen, it says view database. This would allow you to see like an Excel spreadsheet format, one row for each isolate. So after you enter the data, you can still see the data later. Click on view database, when it will show you a database list for you to see all of the results. Uh, you can edit the table, edit the isolates, search. You know, if, if a lot of people leave HUNET open on their computers, waiting for phone calls, the doctor will say, I need the results for Mrs. Jones. So what you do is you go to view database, you do search, you find her results, and then you tell the doctor the results. So a lot of people do use HUNET for clinical reporting. It's not ideal for that, but it, of course it's an important use. We didn't design it for that purpose, and we will. there are things we can do to make it better for that purpose, but it is a common use. A lot of people, you can also see print, you can print out the clinical reports. Um, so HUNET data entry allows you to do data entry, reporting, uh, like on the phone, just by reading it off the screen, or by printing it out and distributing it there. 
Um, there is an option there, Caliper. Most people do not use it. There are these, um, I don't have one here. I have them at the office. It's basically an electronic ruler. You know, you, you can measure the zone diameter with the caliper. Uh, do you see me? I don't know if you see me. <laughs> yes, we do see you. It, you. There's a lot of uh, space on top of your head, but other than that, we see you. Maybe if you move the camera, if you tilt it down a little bit, we'll see you more. But we see you fine and we hear you perfect. Yeah, that's great. Okay, great. So, because I'm going, I'm moving my hands. So. Oh, then this is better. Yes, <laughs> thanks. So with a caliper, a caliper is an electronic. I cannot see you. Well, well some of you, all of you should be seeing the same thing. Yes, you are. Your camera is being seen. Who who cannot see the who cannot see the camera? Who's that? I would like. Well, Jordan, can you see the screen? You don't have to see me, but can you see the screen? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so you can. Yes, set up, screen is that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, you can set up go to meeting to see both uh, the cameras and the screen yeah. or just the screen. But I see, I see both. We we can see you if we set it up. Yeah, you're you're good. Well, it's not so important to see me. Uh, I I move my hands when I talk. So caliper <laughs> yeah. can measure zone diameters. Um, and uh, and then you can automatically put the zone diameters into Hunet. The, these these are not in, these are not inexpensive. The caliper is about one hundred and fifty dollars, and the wire the wire is also about one hundred and fifty dollars. So these digital electronic calipers are about three hundred dollars. Um, there's also a Bluetooth version, which is even more expensive. But I'll just leave it at that. Very few people use calipers. So that's the data entry screen. In the rest of this particular presentation, I will focus on data analysis. And again, it's, okay, this one is animated. Um, uh, the slides that you see in front of you are, were basically made in India. I gave them one of my presentations and they used my slides, but then they put more slides. So it's a mixture of what I did and what they also did. Um, okay, data analysis. The, on this screen, the data analysis screen, there are three required fields on the left. What kind of analysis, which organisms, and which data files? Those are the required questions. On the right, there are additional questions. I just want certain isolates and certain options and one for patient. I'll start from the beginning. So first, we choose the analysis type. Do you want isolate listing? Do you want percent resistance? Do you want multi-resistance? Do you want outbreak alerts? So analysis type, you choose the kind of analysis you would like to do. Then you choose your organisms. You can be very specific, like E. coli or Staph aureus, or you can say all gram negatives or all organisms. Hunit also allows you to do viruses and fungi and parasites. Hunit also allows for no growth, normal flora, contaminated specimen, gram positive caucus. And then the third required question are the data files. Do you want the data from this year, from last year? You want the data from hospital one, the data from hospital 10. Hunet allows you to analyze one file or 5,000 files. So if you have data from 20 hospitals, you can choose the data from all of the hospitals at the same time. In other words, we're not combining the data files, the data files are staying separate, but we can combine their contents during the data analysis. So we'll talk about that more when we talk about national data analysis and national data management. After I've answered these three required questions, which analysis, which organisms, which data, then you can begin the analysis. But there are other options. For example, maybe I do not want all of the Staph aureus and all of the E. coli. Maybe I just want the urine. So I can say specimen type equals urine, outpatient, uh, imipenem resistant, pediatric. Um, I can say uh, from a certain time period, a certain room, just from the ICU. So if I want all of the Staph aureus and all of the E. coli, I do not use this option called isolates. But if I want to put in a patient filter or a location filter or an organism filter, then isolates allows you to do that. Hunet does have other features and other options that we will discuss later. The most important one is one per patient. Um, 
if you have, of course, all of you have very sick people who are in the hospital for a long period of time. And sometimes you will have a patient with Staph aureus five times. They have Staph aureus in the left arm, right arm, urine, blood. They will have Staph aureus on Monday. They'll have Staph aureus again on Friday. Some people ask, should I just put the first one in? I said, no, enter all of them. We want all of them in the database. If the patient has five Staph aureus, put all five into WhoNet. It's also easier for the data entry person because they don't know if it's the first one or not. So if you have five Staph aureus from the same person, put all of them into WhoNet because maybe some of them are MSSA, maybe some of them are MRSA. Maybe some of them are in the ICU from Monday. Some of them are in the outpatient on Thursday. So I do want to see the five results. Did the resistance pattern change? Did the location change? Did the patient have it in blood and urine? So, and this is important, obviously, for clinical reporting. If the doctor sends you five samples, the doctor wants the results from the five samples. So for data entry, enter everything. Also, if you're downloading the data from your laboratory information system, of course, it's going to download everything. But in data analysis, sometimes I want all of them, like I just described, but sometimes I just want the first one or the most resistant result. And that's what the purpose of one per patient is. If I wanna see a list of people with CRE and their movement around the hospital, I wanna see every CRE. But if I wanna calculate the percent resistant to CRE, I, I want to discount one patient at a time. Sometimes if you have a patient with CRE in the ICU, you might have five or 10 CRE from that person. And I want all five or 10 in my database. But if I wanna tell my pharmacy the percent resistant, I don't wanna count that patient 10 times. I just wanna count that patient once. Otherwise, I'm going to bias my statistics to the sickest people with the most resistance, with the most complicated situation. So HUNET allows you to analyze all of the isolates if you want, when it also allows you to analyze one per patient. Both of these options are useful. These are examples of some of the outputs. This analysis is called isolate listing, and I simply asked for a list of people who have MRSA. Okay, I'm gonna show you one slide for each of the analyses. Before I do that, are there any questions? It's easy for me to talk and talk yeah, and yeah. talk. Can you, can you, can you a little bit? Yes? Uh, John, can you a little bit explain uh, uh, how we can identify hospital acquired infection and community infection? This is important for us. Yes, okay. I will go back to the screen called isolates. Okay. Um, so here in the United States, the CDC, the US CDC, has a project called NHSN, National Healthcare Safety Network, and they have two different ways to report multi-drug resistant organisms. So the CDC wants to know the MDRO organisms, the multi-drug resistant organisms, but they allow the laboratories to do it in one of two ways. One is called laboratory defined event. One of them is based purely on laboratory data and WhoNet allows you to do that. So I will tell you how to do inpatient versus outpatient we're using the CDC strategy of just purely using laboratory data. The CDC also offers a different module, which is called clinical reporting. This is much more work. Um, so first I will, first I will, sh I will describe to you the clinical reporting. The clinical reporting, if you find somebody with MRSA, what you need to do is to find that patient's medical chart. Look at the risk factors. How long have they been in the hospital? Did they have surgery? Were they hospitalized because of MRSA or were they hospitalized because of a hip surgery or diabetes or blood pressure and they picked up MRSA during the hospitalization? So this is very manual and it requires the patient medical record. It, decide, it requires a judgment call. The infection control person looks at every detail and decides, yes, I believe that this is a hospital infection. So this is the detailed clinical report module. There are two problems with it. It is very tedious and a lot of work and you need the medical chart. That is one problem in doing this. The other problem in doing this is if you ask 10 different infection control people, 
to tell you if this is a hospital infection, they won't always agree. Sometimes they disagree. Because the truth is, if you give me the information, there are three possible answers. Yes, this is definitely community. Yes, this is definitely hospital. But there's a lot in the middle where we are not sure. And when you're not sure, some people will say it's, an, some people will say it's hospital acquired, some will say it's community acquired. So even though the clinical reporting module is the most thorough and the most detailed, it also has a lot of variability between different people. This is especially true if the hospitals cheat. You know, some hospitals, you know, if you get MRSA, the hospital doesn't want to look bad. So if it's clearly a hospital infection, they will call it MRSA. But if it's maybe a hospital infection, they might call it a community infection so that they don't get penalized in the national picture. So the two problems with the clinical reporting is that it's very detailed, it requires a lot of time and effort and knowledge. Um, and in addition, you end up with variability, different people will have a different judgment call. So now I will describe the other CDC way, which is possible in HUNET, which is the laboratory data approach. What they have, so HUNET specifically does the WHO approach. The WHO approach is based on the CDC approach, but simplified. First, I will describe the CDC approach, which is more complicated. The CDC approach says, if it's hospital day one or, let's see, if the location type is outpatient, we're gonna call it outpatient. That's usually true, it's not always true. For example, if the patient was discharged on Friday, the patient was discharged Friday, and then they go see the emergency room on, if they go to their own private doctor a week later, they might have a hospital infection, but the hospital infection was not clear during the hospitalization. The hospital infection became clear after the patient went home. So this, this is, I'm highlighting some of the deficiencies of the CDC and the WHO approach, but it's also easier. And at the high level, national level, we want to try to keep it realistic and sustainable. So the CDC approach, if it is a sample from the community, we will call it a community infection. That is usually true, but it is not always true if the patient had a recent discharge. If it's, a, if it's an infection from, if it's, a hospital and, if it's a hospital sample from hospital day one or hospital day two, we're gonna call it a community infection because the patient just arrived. The patient was very sick with fever and cough and diarrhea and sputum. They were hospitalized and they had a sample taken on hospital day one or two. So even though this is a hospital sample, we are still going to call this a community infection. But if the sample was taken from hospital day three, hospital day four, hospital day five, we're just gonna call it a hospital infection. We won't always be true. You know, for example, if a patient has an abdominal abscess and you don't take a culture of the abdominal abscess until hospital day four, it is a community infection, but you did not diagnose it until hospital day four. So in short, um, if it's a community sample, we call it community. If it's, a, if it's a hospital sample on hospital day one or two, we call it community. If it's hospital day three or four or five, we call it hospital. <clears throat> what I just told you is the WHO definition. That's the definition that I put into HUNET. The CDC definition is a little bit smarter. If the patient, if it's a sample from hospital day one or two, but the patient has been recently discharged from the hospital, we will call it a hospital infection. In other words, if the patient is, if the patient spends a month in the hospital and then comes to the outpatient clinic three days later, the CDC will call it a hospital infection because the patient just spent a month in the hospital. Certainly scientifically that makes sense, but the laboratory people around the world do not know that the patient was hospitalized last week. So the, so the WHO just takes a little bit of a simpler approach. The CDC definition, you do need to know if the patient was recently hospitalized. And that's not realistic as a simplified definition. So I hope those, that definition is clear. How do we do that in HUNET? The way that we do that in HUNET is we go to isolates and there's an option there. If you have date of admission, there's an option there called hospital day. So if you say hospital day three or later, uh, I, I'll just show you. I'm going to show you HUNET 
I hope you, um, where's my new Hunan? Oh, uh, oh, that's right. This, this is my other old laptop. So I have not updated this Hunet yet. So I'm going to Hunet and I'm going to the WTO test hospital. I'm going to data analysis. I'm going to data analysis. I'll go to isolates. Whoops, uh, hold on. This particular database does not have date of admission in because uh, it's old. So let me just go to clinical information, date of admission. Just ignore what I'm doing. I'm just getting this ready for <laughs> what I want to tell you. Okay. So here you see there is a question called date of admission. After that, there's one called hospital day. So date of admission is a real data field. Hospital day is a pretend data field. It's not a real data field in the database. It is generated during the analysis. So if I want to look for specific date of admissions, I can ask for specific date of admissions. But that's not what we want for our discussion. I can go to hospital day and I can please show me all isolates that are starting at hospital day three or later. You know, like hospital day three to nine, nine, but you don't have to put anything there. So if this is hospital day three or later, it, we're going to consider it to be hospital. If it is hospital day one or two or outpatient, because there should be no, there should be no date of admission, then it's going to be called inpatient. Uh, then it will be called community. Is that clear? Does that help? So yeah. So to use this definition, you need date of admission and you need it entered. Um, you do not need to put a date of admission for the outpatients, of course, but for the inpatients to use this feature, you need the date of admission. I would suggest the date of admission as a, a longer term goal. You need to discuss it with the laboratories. As I said, some people will tell you, yes, it's very easy. We have that. Other ones will tell you, well, it's impossible. We don't have it and we're never going to get it. But I think a lot of your places will tell you, well, we don't have it now, but you know, we could start and next year, hopefully we, we can routinely do, do the date of admission. So when you're getting started, there's so many things to start with. This discrepancy, this, this, this distinction between inpatient and outpatient infections is, um, is not one of the first priority. There are a lot of other priorities. I'm gonna show you one other thing here. There's another field here. As I mentioned to you, there's one called location. Location is very specific. 2A, 4B, 4 East, 4 West, ICU East. That is very specific for this location, which is great for them. For the national level, there's another field called location type, which is the same thing, but it's been simplified and standardized. Inpatient, outpatient, nursing home, uh, farm, you know, uh, uh, restaurant, et cetera. Um, okay. So I told you how the WHO allows you to do inpatient versus outpatient, but to do that, you need the location type and you need the date of admission. A lot of people do not have that. So they should do something which is reasonable. It's not perfect. But if you do not have the date of admission, what you can do easily and say, I want my outpatient samples. That's easy. You can also say, I want my inpatient samples. So, and let me just put ICU, non-ICU. These are different kinds of inpatient samples. Um, so if I do this, it will give me all of my inpatient samples. That is a nice, easy way to say, yes, here are my statistics for my outpatient samples, and here are my here are my results for my inpatient samples. Just keep in mind that the inpatient samples reflect a mixture of inpatient and outpatient infections. That's an important distinction. An inpatient sample is very easy. It means you took it from an inpatient. Whether it's an inpatient infection, that's that's the more complicated question because many community infections are diagnosed during the hospitalization. So if you do not have date of admission, you can use this. This is not as good as using the date of admission, but it is still meaningful. You know, uh, for the inpatient samples, how many of them are hospital day one and how, how many are hospital day three, four, and five, okay? So in short, if you have, if you have the date of admission systematically, use the hospital day. If you don't have that, you know, if you don't have that, just use the location type. And that does allow you to easily separate the community samples from the hospital samples. 
other questions? Everyone? We've played in a bit over one hour so far. I'm just watching the time. Okay, may I ask you one question? Yes. Uh, regarding one per patient. Yes. Okay, uh, suppose we are interested to analyze uh, for introbacteria, that means there are a lot of organisms within this group. So in that case, uh, you know, one per patient, suppose a patient may have uh, SORS and E. coli, so I don't know how Hunet consider which organisms, because both of them are introbacteria. I, I, uh, I so, yes, I understand. I understand. Um, uh, yeah. when, I said one, when I said one isolate per patient, first isolate per patient, I lied. Look here at the top of the screen, uh, which isolate of each species. So when I said first isolate per patient, what I really meant is first isolate per patient per species. So in your example, if the patient has E. coli and Klebsiella and Pseudomonas and Staph, when I say first isolate, I mean first E. coli, first Klebsiella, first Pseudomonas. So does that answer your question? It's the first isolate of each patient per species. Okay, thank you. Okay. And that is what you can do on the screen. I can do it by isolate. I can do it by patient. I can do first isolate or first isolate with antibiotic results, because obviously you don't, you don't do antibiotic testing on everything. Um, or you can do average resistance, most resistant, most susceptible. Um, there's another option. So for the pharmacy, for the CLSI recommendations for annual, annual statistics, and this is the same as the European, the Europeans don't have a document about this, but that's why I'm referring to CLSI. Um, so for annual antibiogram, annual statistics preparation, the, CD, the CLSI recommendation is first isolate per patient per species, or first isolate per patient with antibiotic results. Um, um, but for infection control purposes, we often use this other option called by time interval or resistant phenotype. So it, let's assume that patient, let's assume that a patient has MRSA in January and then MRSA in October. For my purposes of annual antibiograms, I don't want to, the patient has two episodes. Patient has MRSA in January, patient has MRSA again in October. When I'm doing my annual statistics, I only want to count the first MRSA. Because otherwise, I'm counting the people with multiple episodes multiple times, which introduces a bias. Patients with multiple episodes tend to be long-term ICU, sick people with complicated medical histories. So if a patient has MRSA in January and in October, for purposes of annual antibiotic statistics, you take the first one, you take the January one, and you ignore the October one. But that's the pharmacy group. But if you're working with the infection control group, if the patient has an MRSA episode in January and they have MRSA again in October, the infection control people often want to count that twice. That is two episodes of MRSA infection. The MR, if the patient had MRSA bacteremia in January and MRSA bacteremia in October, the infection control people want to count both. So HUNET allows you the flexibility of doing it both ways. So for example, and here there is no standard agreement, so people do what they want. For example, I would like the first isolate every 90 days. If the patient had MRSA in January and February, I just want to count the January isolate. If the patient has MRSA in January and June, I want to count both isolates. Personally, for a lot of our own research, we take the first one per year. The patient has MRSA in 2017 and 2019, we take both. If the patient had MRSA in December of 2018 and January 2019, I just want the December one uh, because it's within my time window here. So for pharmacy, normal clinical statistics, for normal statistics, I recommend by patient, uh, the first isolate only or first isolate with antibiotic results. But, but if you're working with an infection control audience, often they would like to, they, they're not so interested exactly in the patients, they're interested in the episodes. And so these are 
diff these options are useful for different people. Okay. Okay, maybe additional question. Yes. Yeah, if I want to count the number of carbapenem and resistant organisms, I don't know how can we do this one specific to let's say for introbacterice. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, before I answer that, I just have a few more comments about this one isolate per patient. In order to do that, who needs a patient identifier? You know, because it, you know, if uh, so, let's see. Um, maybe my medical record number is one, two, three, four, five. I come back next month. I come back next year. I come back in five years. My number is still one, two, three, four, five. That is a medical record number. Um, the medical record number depends on the hospital, usually. So if I go to a different hospital, I get it usually a different medical record number. Not always, because there are some countries where there is no medical record number, they use the national identification number. So if you go to any hospital, they will always use the same national identification number. So these are useful numbers. Uh, and most of the time we're not most of the time we're not trying to track patients between hospitals. It makes it difficult when they get a different number. So I'm focusing now on removing repeat isolates inside of a laboratory. You would really like a patient number. Because what happens if you don't have a patient number, it's hard to know if the same if it's the same person. Uh, at its extreme, and this is very common, there is no medical record number. If there is no medical record number, the only thing you have to go on is the patient's name or maybe the date of birth and the gender. So this would be important for you to explore in Ethiopia. Does every laboratory have a medical record number? If they don't have a medical record number, are they leaving it empty? Are they putting in the patient's name? One thing I do not recommend, and I do see this many times, is if there is no medical record number, they put the specimen number as the patient number, and that is not correct. The specimen number identifies the specimen. The specimen number does not identify the patient. So if the patient comes back next week, <coughs> they're gonna get a different specimen number. So please do not put the specimen number as the identification number. If there is no identification number, leave it empty. If HUNET sees an empty patient ID, HUNET will automatically use the patient's name instead. Using the patient's name is not perfect. Of course, different people will have the same names. And of course, even the person with the same name, sometimes they'll type it differently. Like my name is John Michael Stelling, but a lot of times I'm just John Stelling. You don't always type my full name. So the best thing is to use a patient medical record number. If you have that, great. If you don't have that, the patient name is pretty good. Of, it's not perfect. Of course, different people might have the same name, um, but it's not often that two people will have the same name and the same bacteria in the same year. If you have a patient, you know, Mary Jones in January with Serratia marcescens, and you have a patient, Mary Jones in June with Serratia marcescens, it's probably the same person. Once in a while, you might be wrong, but it's not going to change the statistics in any important way. So it will be important to explore, and maybe you know already, and if I stop talking, maybe you can comment, uh, but it's important to understand whether or not you have a reliable patient ID. If you do not have a patient ID, uh, then HUNET is just going to use the patient's name, which is pretty good, but it is not perfect. A lot of people have something else which is sort of useful. It's not perfect, but it is helpful. A number of people do not have a patient ID but they do have a hospitalization ID. So if the patient is hospitalized in January, all of the January samples will have the same hospitalization ID, which is very useful for getting rid of the repeats during that hospitalization. But if the patient comes back in October, they're gonna get a different hospitalization ID. So the patient ID is the best. Hospital ID is not bad, it's not perfect. Hospital ID is good, because it allows you get, to get rid of the repeats during one hospitalization. So I'm going to stop right there on this question. Do you, do you know what you have? Do people have medical record numbers? Do they put the patient's name? Do they have a hospital ID? Uh, yes? I don't know if they heard your question, but you you came through. You're yeah, you're good. Uh, but I okay, don't know. Well, 
I'll just continue then. Uh, if you have a question, say it or go to the chat window. Okay, so I'm describing you these wonderful features about by isolate, by patient, by time interval, but they only work if you have a reliable patient ID or a semi-reliable patient ID like the patient's name. So I'm now going to continue. And uh, you had a question about CRE. Um, sure. Um, okay, I'm going to show you data from the WHO test hospital. And I already know the, these are old data and they're not, there are no CRE. So the first thing I'm going to show you, there will be no results, but I will show you. And then I'll change to a, a different antibiotic. So I'm going to go to analysis type. It depends on what you want. You said you wanted to count them. So if you want to count them, I go to isolate listing and summary. If I want my percent resistance among CRE, I don't want that right now. I want to see the people who have CRE. And I want the list. I want the summary. I want both. I want both. And I'm going to leave it at that. I want, and I click on OK. Organisms, I can choose E. coli, serratia, or I'm going to organism groups. There is an option here called all enterobacteriaceae. So you can do all the enterobacteriaceae at the same time. And I click on OK. I click on data files. And we give people one month of sample data for teaching purposes. So that's what I will show you. I'm now clicking on OK. So, um, and I'm just going to begin analysis. So this is a list of everything. Um, it's, so here, let me go to the imipenem column. So imipenem, 27 millimeters, 29 millimeters, 26 millimeters, all of these are large sensitive results. I'm going to click on imipenem, and you can see the smallest zone diameter is 18. Well, actually, you know, at that time, I forgot about this, at 18 at that time was considered sensitive. In fact, I think 18 is now intermediate or resistant. So in fact, this will work. Um, but so this is one way. I don't recommend this particular way. But what I've done is I've gone to imipenem and I've sorted it. So I see 18, 19, 20. So these here are going to be resistant or intermediate. So this is one way that I do not recommend. Why don't I recommend it? Because I have all of the sensitive ones. I have the resistant and the sensitive ones mixed together. I'm going to click on continue. Here is my summary. I see that I have 86 E. coli from 71 people, but that is a mixture of sensitive and resistant ones. And I'll click on continue. So basically, I did not answer your question yet, but I'm showing you how to do isolate listing for all enterobacteriaceae for the sensitive ones and the resistant ones. I'm now going to go to isolates. And here I see patient name, age, date of birth, but at the bottom I see the antibiotics. And I see imipenem. So I'm going to go to imipenem. I double click or I click on define criteria. And I can say resistant or I can say non susceptible. Non susceptible would be the resistant isolates and also the intermediate isolates. So it depends on what you want. Okay. Do you want the resistant or do you want the intermediate? I'm sorry, was there a comment? Uh, resistant. Okay. So yeah, we need the resistant. I will do the resistant ones. Also, you can say greater than, less than, equal. You know, so you can look at high level resistance, less than eight. You know, from so you, there's a lot of options here. You can also say tested or not tested. But uh, so resistant. Yes. yes? Yeah, that's okay. Resistant, great. I'll click on okay. And um, and that's it. I'll just say imipenem. Uh, I can click on okay. And I will now begin this analysis. It will now show exactly the same results, but only the isolates that are including imipenem resistant. So in this database, there were only six isolates. Those six okay. isolates came from six different people. Because here, I do like to see the repeats because a lot of times it will be three times from one person. So I'd like to see, I'd like to see all of the isolates. In this example, it is six isolates from six people, but it could have been six isolates from the same person. 
there are different reasons why I like to see the, the, there's one reason why I like to see all of the isolates. I already mentioned some of those reasons. Um, I wanna see what rooms were they in? Did the patient move? Did the isolate going from sensitive to resistant or resistant to sensitive? It was a blood, urine. So I mentioned these reasons why I want to see the repeats. There is also another reason. Um, in the past, CRE was very, very, was very, very rare. It almost did not exist except as a laboratory error. Imipenem is an unstable drug. In a hot tropical environment, the imipenem discs have a tendency to degrade. So we used to see a lot of CRE, but it was false CRE. It was just the imipenem disc was bad. Um, so if I see imipenem resistance from one person, it, it might be a mistake. It might be true, but it might be a mistake. But if I see imipenem resistance four times from the same person, that just reinforces that this is a real finding. Okay, so by having the repeats, it allows me to just re reconfirm that this is probably not a laboratory error. If it's the same patient over and over, it's probably true. This is an additional reason why I like to see the re repeat isolates. Okay. There is something very interesting about Morganella morganii. Morgan the, so there's something called intrinsic resistance. And for some reason, Morgan Morganella morganii, they don't call it intrinsic resistance. They call it intrinsic decreased susceptibility which is basically the same thing. So I'm actually not surprised to see the Morganellas here because the Morganellas have always been a little bit resistant to imipenem, to meropenem. So this confirms to me that the system is working. It is, Morganella is more resistant intrinsically to imipenem than, than other enterobacteriaceae. And then we have here Proteus mirabilis and Proteus species. I completely forgot about this. This I'm going to Google right now. Proteus also has intrinsic resistance. Uh, Proteus, Proteus imipenem resistance. The overexpression. I won't go into details on this, but both Proteus and Morganella are organisms where there is some resistance, which is ancient. Most CRE is modern, but for these two organisms. It's always been there to some degree. Okay, I didn't want to spend too much time on the microbiology, uh, and you asked me how to do something mechanically, but I am interested to see that it's only the Morganella and the Proteus that came up here as resistant. Now I'm going to click on continue, and I now get the summary, and I see there were three Morganella isolates from three people, two from two, one from one. So it is counting the number of isolates separately from the number of patients. In our example, it's one to one, so the numbers are the same. But what you might see are six isolates of Morganella coming from three different people. And then very valuable, I can see January, February, March, these are the number of people. So this allows you to look at the growth over time. Or we have more, do we have more CRE? So as we start to get into feedback reports, standard reports, you can do this on a monthly basis. I'm, I'm working now with the Vietnamese on this kind of thing. They already have these nice monitors about data volume. The data volume went up, the data volume of total samples went up, down. Data completeness went up, data completeness went down. So they did these not for epidemiological reasons, it's more for project monitoring. Are they doing data completeness well? Are they, do they have, is the data vol, if the data volume goes from 600 isolates to 620 to 580 to six, that means something's wrong, so the data are missing. So the Vietnam have started to do this, but so far they're not doing it for scientific resistance issues. They will, we're working now on that, but that's what you can see here. If you did this kind of analysis monthly for CRE, it can help you to find a possible outbreak. Okay, continue. How do you measure data completeness? Okay, great. Um, Let's see. That's the next question. I want to continue a little bit on here. Um, so here I asked for imipenem resistance. There, but there are a lot of people who do, imi, lo, there are a lot of labs who do imipenem. Other laboratories do meropenem. 
Uh, the laboratory I'm showing you here uh, does not have meropenem. You see it goes imipenem mesnicillin. I'm gonna take a quick little detour. Antibiotics, meropenem, meropenem, good, meropenem, good, good, good. Oh, and let me just put it together. Antibiotics, meropenem, meropenem. And I'm going to move up. And so I want to put it in alphabetical order. Good, that's perfect. Okay, save data analysis. Uh, okay, so here I can say I want the isolates imipenem resistant. And then I could put meropenem resistant. And let me just repeat the same analysis. I go to isolate listing and summary. Okay. And I say EBC, all interbacteriaceae. I choose the same month of sample data. I say, okay. And it says it found none. There are no isolates. But what happened to the, what happened to the Morganella? And that's what I wanted to explain here. So here I see, imipenem resistant, meropenem resistant. I want to draw your attention to this option at the bottom of the screen. Include isolates that satisfy all of the selection criteria. In other words, I am now asking for bacteria that are resistant to imipenem and also resistant to meropenem. The problem is they didn't test meropenem and that's why there were no results. None of these isolates are imipenem and meropenem resistant because we didn't test the meropenem. Or more precisely, they are meropenem resistant, but we didn't, we don't know that. So we, so here I'm saying I want imipenem resistant, that's fine. I want meropenem resistant, we don't know because we did not do the test. And that's why when I choose this feature, there were no isolates because it's looking for bacteria resistant to both of these drugs. There's another feature here, include isolates that satisfy at least one of the selection criteria. What this means is resistant to imipenem or meropenem. Now, when I run this analysis, I see the six isolates and all of these bacteria are resistant to imipenem specifically, <laughs> but there isn't the imipenem or meropenem, but, in, but of course there were no meropenem results. So I'm going back to, and that's the summary, the same thing. Here at the top, isolates satisfy at least one of the following criteria, imipenem resistant or meropenem resistant. This is very important at the national level because some of your labs will do imipenem, some will do meropenem, some will do ceftriaxone, some will do cefotaxime, some will do cipro, some will do levo. So I do recommend standardizing it because it's just easier for you if everybody just tests imipenem. If everybody, if everybody tests imipenem, it's a lot easier. You only focus on imipenem. But if some labs do imipenem, some labs do meropenem, HUNET can still handle that, but you do have to do some more work to combine them together in the way that, for example, in the way that I just did. Okay, so you ask, and uh, this Question. option, yes? Question. Yeah, can you yes. do the same analysis using a specimen type urine? Just this analysis, but using urine specimen. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is let me get rid of the meropenem. So I can just make this, okay, we'll clear this criterion. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the reason I, I got rid of the meropenem is I want to, okay, well, um, I want to include isolates that satisfy all of the selection criteria. I want urine and imipenem resistant. So, so this yes. is imipenem resistant. And now I'm going to go to specimen type, specimen type, and I'm going to say urine. There, in fact, are several kinds of urine. There's urine, urine from bladder. So I'm just going to choose all of them. So this is all of the different kinds of urine. So now I want bacteria that are in urine and also imipenem resistant. I removed okay. the meropenem. Maybe if we have, maybe, what? maybe in, uh, without moving, uh, you have actually only impenem, but in our country, uh, some hospitals, they have meropenem, 
uh, ethi they are using impenum and sometimes meropenum uh, we do have actually uh, all all carbapenem drugs in that case uh, maybe i don't know uh, how can i explain for you uh, you know the conditions or and end in hunet i don't know we can use uh, John, yes, yes. That's can, so, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes, I hear you perfectly. Uh, you have a very important question. And I can tell you the things that HUNET can do now and the things HUNET can do in the future. So um, I removed the meropenem because of the point that you just made. Because if I say I wanted to be specimen type, well, specimen type equals urine and resistance to imipenem or meropenem, HUNET gets confused. It doesn't know what's and, it doesn't know what's or. So what? So if I want to do imipenem, I'm sorry, if I wanted to, let me start with the simple case. This case is going to work. Um, specimen type equals urine and also imipenem equals resistant. This is going to work. Yeah. And it's on three. So these are all urine. And these are all imipenem resistant. So here it's this and so all. So it is N, yeah. But if I try to do, okay. But if I try to do, um, okay. If I go to meropenem and I say resistant, this analysis will work, but it won't give you what you want. This analysis is specimen type equals urine and imipenem equals resistant and meropenem equals resistant. But there, are, but they won't find anything because we don't have any meropenem results. So what you want is this, and this or this. And so I'm going to try to do that. And and but as you can see, I have the choice of and, and I have the choice of or. Uh, why is it not clicking? Okay. And if if I click on this, it's saying I don't know what you want. What do you want? And what do you want? Or um, so I know exactly what you want, and there is a way to do it, but not in the way that I showed you. The way that I showed you what we really would like to do, uh, uh, I'm going to take a little detour on macros. Macros are wonderful. I'm going to click on macros. Something strange yeah, is happening. Okay. My mouse is frozen. I must have accidentally clicked something. So my mouse is now frozen, but I can still use my finger. Uh, macros. <laughs> So no more mouse today, or I don't know if I have to reboot or something. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to new macro. And I'm going to call this urine and CRE. I'm going to click on save and save. Just as a reminder, what is a macro? A macro means if I leave Hunet and I come back next week, I can go to data analysis, I can go to macros, I can go to urine and CRE and load. So it simply is a way to remember what I was doing already. So if I do the same analyses every week, the same analyses every month, the macros make it very easy to do that. The macros themselves are very okay. simple. I'm going to click on urine and CRE. I'm going to click on edit. So here what you see is isolates equals urine. And here, and I see imipenem is resistant uh ameripenem is resistant and here you see the or aspect so it's this or this or this basically what i would like to do in the future is allow you to mix and an or okay so if you want to do and an or as one step hunet does not currently permit that but we can do it as two steps and i do this a lot for my own projects when we were looking for outbreaks, I want to look for outbreaks on the CRE, on the inpatients, hospital day three and later. So I wanted this and this, but imipenem or meropenem. So I do exactly what you have described, but I do it in two steps. I will now show you how I do this in two steps. Let me just get rid of that. Okay. So I'm now gonna show you how to do and and or as a two-step process. Step one is to get a data subset that I'm interested in. I'm going to go to analysis type. I'm going to isolate listing and I'm choosing isolate listing. So far so good. 
I click on okay. Organisms, I say EBC for all Enterobacteriaceae, I say okay. And data files, I choose my one month of sample data, I say okay. And then I go to isolates and I say imipenem resistant or meripenem resistant. I'm going to run this and it is going to give me the six. Um, oh, okay. And I forgot to change this to or. So we're going to see the six results here. So great. These are the six um, CRE. That is step one. I find my CRE. The secret here is I don't want, and again, my mouse isn't working. I don't want to output this to the screen. I want to output this to a HUNET file. HUNET uses DBase, so I'm just going to choose DBase. And I'm going to call this a file called, you know, um, Enterobacteriaceae CRE 1995 or something. Dot TST or dot DBS. Dot TST is fine. HUNET has just run that analysis that I showed you on the screen. But instead of showing you it on the screen, I outputted it to a new file. That new file indeed is a HUNET file. Um, oh, but it's in a different folder. What, what folder is it in? Oh, okay. You see here it says Vermont. That's because I'm in the middle of something else. Uh, uh, let me just change this to HUNET. I was doing, I'm doing a manuscript, so I changed my output folder. Let me redo this and I'm going to output to the HUNET folder. And now here in the HUNET folder, output. So here you see, uh, where is it? ABC, there it is. So you see this file, I'm in Windows, HUNET output. You see this file here called EBC CRE 1995 test. That is the output of this analysis of the isolate listing analysis, but it is also a HUNET file because the listing is basically the HUNET file. It's just a list of the bacteria. So instead of choosing my one month of sample HUNET data, I can choose this EBC CRE. Let me say isolates. I want all isolates. Let me put this on the screen. Let me change this to all. So isolate listing, all organisms with this new data file, begin analysis. So what you can see is the complete content of this file are the CRE Enterobacteriaceae. That is step number one. Does that make sense? We took a very large HUNET file and we extracted a small HUNET file out of it. I could have extracted blood. I could have extracted um, urine. I could have extracted ICU. I could have extracted imipenem resistance, which is what I did. So step one is to make a file that has what I part of what I want. That's step one. And now that I've done that, and I say all, 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 it has those six isolates. I will now go to isolates, and now I will go to specimen type, and I will say urine. Okay, okay, begin analysis. And now I just see the three. So this is exactly what you asked for, but I had to do it as yes. two steps. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yes. In the future, it would be nice if we had a nice macro editor and, and, or, or, and, uh, and I would like to do that eventually, but you asked me now, and this is what you can do now to answer that question. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, next question, and we have about, you know, a little less than 20 minutes left. Um, I'm ready for another question, or you can give me guidance on what you would like to see next. And I, I had a question on how, how you measure um, data completeness. Thank you. I forgot about that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, good. That's an excellent question. And I'm working now. So the Vietnam, so, so Vietnam took a lot of good ideas from HUNET. They copied them. They expanded them. And they made the formatting wonderful. So they started with HUNET, but then they went beyond what I did. 
Now, what I am doing is taking some of their ideas and getting them back into Hunet. Um, so let's see. I want to show you what we are doing with Vietnam. But before that, I'll show you where we all started. I'm going to click on exit. So there's this feature in Hunet called data analysis, quick analysis. There's interactive data analysis, and then there's quick analysis. So here you can see there at the top are two standard reports that all Hunet users have. At the bottom, you see user-defined reports. VT is the code for Vermont. I'm working on a manuscript. We just had it accepted, preliminary accepted. I just so so you see here. I've done this special thing for Vermont. Um, we're going to spend our time on the standard report, but just to show you what I did for Vermont, I did one analysis for staph aureus resistance, and you can see here I did it for the for the full state. I did it for the long-term care facilities. I did it overall. I did it by laboratory. I did it by blood and urine and age. So by doing these macros, my user-defined macros, I can say, this is what I want. It takes time to set that up. But then I can do the exact same thing every month in a very quick and easy way. That's We can discuss those later. I want to focus on the user standard report. So if you look at the UNET standard report, uh, the things I like about it, it's easy. You don't have to do anything. Um, that's what I like about it. It's a lot of valuable information in a quick, easy way. The two things I do not like about it is the Hunet standard report uh, is not customizable. You can't, you can't change it. It is what it is. It's a standard report that you cannot change. That's one thing I don't like. The other thing I don't like is the formatting is not very attractive. So what I would like to do is merge together the features of the user-defined reports with the standard reports. The main difference is historical. The Hunet standard report, I wrote that 20 years ago. And the user-defined reports I wrote around 15 years ago. So now with the Fleming Fund as the new priority is to make a better looking configurable standard report and based on a lot and expanding the report. That's the other thing I wanted to expand it. So let me go to the Hunet standard report and go to data files. And as you can see under edit, there are different sections. There's a summary, statistics, alerts, alerts, et cetera. Data files. Let me choose, uh, let me go change back to my other folder, my data folder. Okay, good. Then I click on OK. So this is the standard report that is 20 years old and it needs, a, it needs an overhaul. Okay. Um, great. So you see section A, B, C, D. A is the summary. It simply tells you there were six, there was one laboratory in that data file. There were 622 isolates. Uh, the isolates in that data file went from January 1st, 1995, January 31st, 1995. That's correct. It is one month of data. This allows you to find typing mistakes. Sometimes people put the wrong year. They put the year 2029, or they'll put the year 2002. So this helps you to find errors in the dates. So section A is a high level summary. Section B, it's giving you these ideas about completeness. Laboratory 100% complete, location is complete, department, identification number, one of the isolates, the identification number was uh, missing. So this is one area where you can look for completeness. Then you have another column called invalid. You know, is it a required or not a required field? The following fields have no data. To a large degree, that's because of confidentiality. I got rid of them. Um, and then we have the detailed statistics. Location, 8% were cardiology, 7% cardiac surgery, emergency room, ICU. So these are helping to answer your question about completeness. In Vietnam, one thing I am recommending, and also Sri Lanka, when I'm having the same overlapping conversation with a number of groups, I think it also makes sense not only to put completeness field by field by field, this is what you see here, but to also give them a score, to give them a score on completeness. But I don't want to give them a score on completeness of every field. I want to give them a score on completeness of the most important fields. If they don't put, and that's a, so if they don't put the beta lactamase, well, that's fine. It's not always relevant. Even if it is relevant, you don't have to do the test. Um, things like 
And there's certain things like medical record number. I want that to be complete. Things like date of birth and gender, I would like that to be complete, but how realistic is that? In the short term, hopefully realistic. So I think that patient ID uh, and age and gender would be good fields for scoring. Something like date of admission is not realistic for most places in the short term. So I would suggest that out of the full list of HUNET fields, you decide what are the fields that are relevant at the national level and try to standardize those. And among those fields relevant at the national level, which is the minimum core set that you want to score them on. And then you can say for that core set, patient ID, date of birth, or uh, not date of birth, but age. Um, uh, between patient ID, date of birth, uh, age, and gender, we have, if, if we have 100 records, there are 300 possible values. You know, the, the, the ID, the age, and the gender. Of those 300 possible values, they have entered 250 of them. So then we can give a score on completeness. So to do that, you would need to decide what are the core fields you want to use for that high level completeness score. HUNIT already gives you the field by field completeness score, but some of these fields are more important than others. I don't want to penalize them if they didn't enter the first and the last name. I don't want to penalize them if they don't enter the beta lactamase result. So does that does that help? That's excellent. Yes, yeah. thank you. I think this concept also applies to antibiotic testing. Of course, I would love the hospitals to all test 15 antibiotics, and I can recommend test these 15. The reality is I want them to test at least these five. So if they have 100 E. coli and I want them to do these five, I can do, HUNED already allows you to do the percent completeness for each antibiotic. You know, you had 100 E. coli, you have 80 ampicillins, means ampicillin is 80% complete. So HUNED allows you to do that already. But we would like to allow you to define a core set for scoring purposes. So if you say, well, we want you to test these 12, because you know, 12 is a common number, because if you have one big plate or two small plates, 12 is how many fit. But a lot of places only test one panel, one plate, and that's six. So you might want to recommend they test 12, but you may want to score them on the six. For E. coli, uh, I want ampicillin, cotrimoxazole, cipro, genomycin, and whatever else as my first line core testing. And then you can give them a score. Among these five antibiotics, they've done 90% of requested. You can also have uh, supplemental drugs like independent amamicacin. These are often second line drugs. There's first, so there are two concepts. There's first line testing and second line testing. There's also first line reporting and second line reporting. Uh, what we do and what a lot of people do is they will test 12 drugs but they will only test, they will only tell the doctor six of the drugs. So they do this because if you have an E. coli in urine sensitive to all 12, you have an E. coli sensitive to ampicillin and also sensitive to imipenem. We test imipenem, we always test it, we test all 12. But I don't want to tell the doctor the imipenem result because the doctor might not know it's more expensive, it's a reserve agent, I want them to get an ID approval. So this is an example of first line testing of 12 drugs but first line reporting of six drugs. So I always test by to selectively report. There's a different concept of selective testing. Day one, I test six drugs. If it is resistant, then on day two, I will test some more drugs. I don't like that because for epidemiology, the more data, the better. So if I want 12 drugs, I try to test all 12 drugs in the first day. Anyway, that's different from the scoring issue. I might want to score them on the five key drugs that I want them to test, and that they're going to be scored on that. I also may want to score them, but not penalize them, on the supplemental drugs that we recommend, but we do not require. So if you have 300 E. coli and five core antibiotics, uh, you have 100 E. coli and you have five key antibiotics, there should be um, 500 results. So you can score them on the minimum required sets. So I'm suggesting basically define a minimum score, a minimum set of data fields that they will be scored on, as well as a minimum set of antibiotics that they will be scored on. And that will be different for the different species. Does that help? 
Yes, that's good. Data fields and antibiotics, yes. I'm now going to go to, and I, I will email this to you. Um, uh, what am I doing here? Who not develop, no, wrong folder. And here. And going to WhoNet development. This is our active programming area. And standard. Oh, I'm on the wrong laptop. Um, uh, I had this laptop for repair because the monitor was broken. They they said they could not fix the monitor, and I got it back two days ago, and the monitor was working. <laughs> they lied to me. They fixed it with somehow. They fixed it accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, then I'm going to go to email and emailing myself and standard report. Uh, I, I'm taking the time to do this because it's a very important discussion. Um, browse and C drive and I go to WhoNet development and I go to standard reports and if I go to, yeah, I'll just email all five of these. Hopefully none of them are big. I don't want to slow this down. Um, and what's the fun, what's the latest one here? 1105 feedback, ideas for discussion. Uh, and what's the size of these? Okay. And let me click on that standard. And I very much welcome your input, first of all, into the content of the report, the formatting of the report, I, I'm not ready to act on yet. I want to make sure the content is good before we get to the formatting. So I've now emailed it to myself. Let's see how long it takes to arrive. Oops, all done. And this, this. I just restarted the one of the files was big, so I just reset it. And hopefully it's been mailed. Good, good. It has been mailed. Now let me go on this laptop. Outlook. Net. And hopefully it should arrive momentarily. Okay, so in short, I think Mikhail and I think Fern, I think I may have already sent to you uh, some reports from Vietnam and Australia and Japan. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go to the Hunet standard report, that one file I just sent. I think you sent the Australian one, I, oh, and, then, and the Vietnam one too, I believe. Yes, you're right. Okay, so this is based on that, but I didn't send you further. Uh, I emailed myself the wrong document. I sent a Word document. Um, I'm going back now to here, and I'm just going to join our call from the computer with the bad microphone uh, and I will turn off the volume on that. Go to meeting, okay. Just providing a time check here. We have about three three minutes left. Oh, thanks, yes. Uh, okay, I am now in. I just I've turned off the microphone. Why have it go? Better? Oh, I'm using the microphone on the bad computer. Which microphone do you want to use? Do you want me to make you presenter on the other computer? Yes, yes.
here I have put a lot of um, content, data completeness, number, these are examples, number of labs, number of John, could you speak into your other uh, mic, please? We can't hear you. How is this? Still not, oh, let's not discuss it. Okay, I left that. Uh, anyway, there's not enough time, but basically I've started to put some thought into precisely, oh, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, yes, we can. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, uh, so I'll send it to you, and I think this could be a very good discussion uh, for what should be in the standard report. Uh, different ways of scoring, different measures of completeness, looking at data quality, microbiology quality. So the, so the Vietnamese took my ideas, they expanded them. Now what I've done is I've expanded them further. We have not implemented it yet. We're trying to define what we would like to be in the new standard report, capturing all of these ideas. And there would be basically uh, two kinds of facility report. One report would be a data submission report. Somebody sends you the data for March, you analyze thoroughly in many ways the data for March, and you provide them a feedback on their submission. Also for the facility, we want a temporal trend to say, well, the data volume has gone up, the, the completeness has gone down, the, um, the, uh, there are possible outbreaks. These are the trends in CRE. So we're looking for facility-specific data quality feedback on a monthly basis, but also temporal trends with data volume and completeness and CRE and outbreaks. Those would be facility specific feedback, submission reports and temporal reports. And then we consider a different set of discussions about national benchmarking, national, feed, national monthly reports and national time trend reports. Um, so the, I'll send you this file which has taken the Vietnamese ideas and put more new ideas into it and this would be a good subject of discussion in the future. Uh -huh.